Welcome to the Marriage Counselor's Corner. Right this way. Your therapist will see you shortly. In the meantime, sit back, kick your feet up on the couch, and get ready to focus on adding very valuable tools to your marriage toolkit. And now your host and marriage counselor, David Taylor. Welcome, welcome, welcome. What's up, everybody? My name is David Taylor, and I am your host. Welcome back to another information-packed episode of the Marriage Counselor's Corner podcast. And this is the place where you're going to get credible and tangible marriage-related information from a licensed mental health counselor. That's right. You're getting information from someone who's in the field working hard to make sure that your marriage is better. And over my past almost two decades of clinical experience, I have discovered the things that work to make your marriage healthy. So I want you to see these episodes as a masterclass in marriage where I take a psychological and practical approach to marriage education and enrichment. And this is episode number 24. And in today's session, I will be discussing a topic that many of you probably haven't heard of, or at the very least, if you've heard about it, you haven't spent too much time really researching and studying this to a deeper degree. So don't worry, don't fret. I got the information for you today, and I'm going to share this with you. And today I'm going to be discussing a a very important topic related to turning towards your spouse. And in today's episode, I'm going to be discussing the importance of turning towards your spouse. Now, see, I could tell by the title that it's not that alluring, right? It's not like the top 10, top 10 tips of conflict resolution or it doesn't have that, that twang to it. So this is probably why this type of topic won't be as preferential, but I'm telling you guys, This stuff is really, really, really important. As a matter of fact, a lot of this stuff can make or break your marriage. So I'm going to be discussing the importance of turning towards your spouse. And if you've read my book, The 37 Laws to Mastering Marriage, uh, this information is found in chapter 36, where I cover the law of the right turn. But if you haven't read my book and you've read Dr. Dr. Gottman's best-selling book, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. This is one of the principles of his book. And as a matter of fact, this research that I'm using and referencing, I've gleaned from the work that he's done because, you know, he's been in the field for decades and decades. So um, this stuff may sound familiar if you've already done work in this area. If not, though, tune in, get your book, get your pen and pad and be ready to take some notes. Um, Before I go, though, I want to say this. Remember, healthy marriages do not just happen out of the blue. They are created, they are crafted, they are nurtured, and they are made up of individuals who take the time to learn, take the time to study, to research how to be more efficient as a husband and a wife. And this is something new that I've been really focusing on over the last couple of weeks, efficiency maximizing your efficiency as a spouse. And so you'll hear me reference this throughout the course of upcoming episodes as well. And this is going to be something that as soon as I'm done with this PhD and I'm able to really dive deeper into, I'm going to be focusing a lot on efficiency and making sure that you are efficient as a husband and as a wife. But anyway, healthy marriages are made up of individuals who are efficient, who study, who are nerds when it comes to how to be better at this thing we call marriage. And these individuals, they study, they learn, and they grow over time consistently. So there is consistent growth, not seasonal growth, meaning I'm not just growing for one season and then I'm done. No, I'm I'm in this and I'm consistently in this working, toiling, laboring, growing, researching, studying, right? Learning the things that I don't know. Coming, becoming aware of what I'm ignorant in and improving in those areas. This is what it requires in order to be a good spouse, an efficient spouse. And this topic, this concept of turning towards your spouse, this topic will help you to be less ignorant in a very important but often overlooked area of your marriage. So let's start by discussing some research. 
And actually, let me say this first. I want you to stick around until the end because in the end, I will be giving you guys an action item. And this action item is a series of 20 questions that I would like for you guys to answer regarding your marriage. So make make sure that you stick around for that because I want you to take some notes, write these down, and then discuss this with your spouse. But more on that in a bit. For now, let's go ahead and talk about this notion of turning towards your spouse, or as I put it, the law of the right turn. And I'll be referencing my book, the information that's included in chapter 36. If you have this book, follow along. If not, listen closely. Okay, so let's start with some research. As part of Dr. Gottman's research, and you know he he has what's called the Gottman Institute and the Seattle Love Lab, and he does a lot of groundbreaking research with individuals about relationships, specifically about relationships. And as part of, you know, the research that he's done over the last 30 years, um, he's conducted some a study. He conducted a study with newlyweds, and then he followed up with those individuals six years later. And he noticed some things that pretty much was, like I said, groundbreaking when it comes to understanding how to be more efficient in your marriage. And he noticed something about these couples. He said that the couples that stayed together or the couples that stayed married were much, much better at one thing as it compares to the couples who didn't stay married or their marriage was already struggling. He said these couples were much, much better at this one thing. He said that the couples that stayed together, they turned towards their spouse instead of away from their spouse after a bid. And I'm going to talk about what a bid is in a moment so that you guys can really understand this notion. But he talked about how at at the six-year follow-up, couples that had stayed married turned towards their spouse 86% of the time. He also noticed that couples that had divorced averaged turning towards their spouse only 33% of the time. And so what this study found is that One of the largest secrets, one of the most important things to really keep in mind as it pertains to having a successful marriage is turning towards your spouse after a bid. Now, I don't want you to I don't want you to just overlook this. This is really, really important information, actually pretty incredible that this information exists, because what it does is it suggests that there is literally something you can do today, right now, that will dramatically change the course and trajectory of your marriage. See, more importantly, this information suggests that there is something that if not done properly will lead to your marriage's demise. And that is what the law of the right turn, which is what I call it in my book, that's what this law is all about, right? This law suggests that in order to improve the chances of your marriage succeeding, you must turn towards your spouse when they offer up a bid. And this law, the law of the right turn, or turning towards your spouse, this law states that there is a right turn and, guess what, a wrong turn that you can take with your spouse inside of your marriage. And that you must make the right turn by turning towards them after a bid. Now. What I didn't do is explain to you what a bid is. So if you've never heard what a bid is, or if this information is relatively new, let me spend some time discussing what a bid is, what it looks like. And then I'm going to talk about why this is so important, why this is necessary as it pertains to securing a long lasting, healthy and efficient marriage. So what is a bid? So a bid is any attempt from your spouse to get some level of attention affirmation, connection, validation, or some type of positive connection from you to them. So anytime your spouse or you attempted to connect to your spouse for the expressed intent of having more connection, more intimacy, more attention, more validation, more affirmation, or even just to enjoy a positive moment, that's what a bid is considered. See, bids show up in simple and very basic ways, such as a smile, a wink, but 
They can also show up in more complex and tangible manners like a request for advice, a solicitation for help, an invitation for intimacy or for connection. And in general, women tend to make more bids than men, right? And I can spend more time talking about that if need be, if you guys got a question on that. But women tend to make more bids than men. And I'll actually go a step further to say that their bids are much more overt and much more noticeable as compared to husbands. But in the healthiest relationships, both partners are comfortable making all kinds of bids and are equally comfortable responding to those bids. And this part is important because what I found is that a lot of times in marriage, people are so afraid of rejection that they don't even put the bids out there anymore. Maybe there's been a history, like, for instance, in my marriage early on, where there was a history where I would probably reject my wife's bids or I just wouldn't be as aware of her bids, right? And so maybe perhaps she learned over time to not be as as overt in her bids, or maybe she just held them all in altogether, right? So, and I'm sure you guys, some of you guys have experienced that, that as well. But a bid is a unique way of communicating and connecting to your spouse. And to go a step further, it's a unique way of communicating to your spouse a need or a desire without explicitly expressing that particular need and or desire. A bid will usually have a below the surface or between the line meaning that is not directly implied. Okay. So this, if you're looking, if you're thinking about this, this is why a lot of times husbands may not make as many bids and they will miss more bids because they're not implied. Then it's going to have a below the surface meaning. Whereas remember, men are more linear. We're more two dimensional. Women are not linear. They're four-dimensional creatures. They're four-dimensional feelers. As a matter of fact, I actually may do a a teaching, a whole teaching on just this idea of the four-dimensional feeler and the two-dimensional feeler, just so that you guys know the difference between the two. But women, they exist in this 4D state of being. Men, we don't, which is why it's easy for us to either not submit a bid unless we're directly wanting something. Hey, let's have sex, right? (laughs) Straight to the point. Let's Let's skip all the shenanigans. Uh, But women, they tend to make more covert bids. Theirs is not as overt. So it's the difference between what is verbally said, which is the text, and the true meaning of what is said, which is the subtext. Let me give you a few examples, and these are very basic. I'm sure you can think of some on your own. But here are a few examples of the difference between a text and a subtext, which is this is what's on the surface versus this is what's going on beneath the surface. So for instance, she may ask you, how do I look? And again, this is a classic. This is classic. A wife will say, how do I look? Or ask that question. And if the husband is not paying attention, if he's not studied his wife, if he hasn't studied the art of four-dimensional communication, right? If he ain't studied that, he's going to say, oh, you look good. Or he's going to answer that linear question. Not knowing that that question is a bid. It's a bid for validation. She could actually be meaning which is the subtext, do you still find me attractive? But because she just asked the question of how do I look, he answered that linear question without understanding that, wait a minute, she just submitted a bid and I failed the test. I completely missed the opportunity. She could also say something like, let's put the kids to bed. (laughs) And he may, in his linear mind, be thinking, wait, what? no, did they, you know, he may be trying to figure out what problem is that is there to solve versus reading or not reading the subtext, which is I would like some focused time with you, right? That could be an invitation for focused intimate time. But if he's not focused on that, he may miss the mark. Or for instance, he may say, I talked to my sister today. And if she's not understanding that, wait a minute, my husband just gave me a bid. She may sh- just say, oh, what would y'all talk about? Right. Instead of saying, oh, wait, he needs to vent to me right now. He's not really trying to tell me all the details. He wants to just express something that he's struggling with. And he wants me to create time and space for that. Right. That's the difference between text and subtext. Right. Another one is I had a bad lunch meeting today. And if let's say, for instance, he says that to you or she says that to him and he's not paying attention. 
he may be like, oh, what what happened, right? He may just ask that question. Instead of understanding that beneath the surface, what she's really asking for is, hey, I would like to relax and I need you to help me relax because I had a stressful day today, right? So I need my I need my forehead rubbed or I need my shoulders rubbed or I need, I need you to rub my feet. And maybe she's not explicitly asking that, but if he's studied her, he'll understand how she communicates bids or wife. If you're studying him, then you will understand how he submits bids. And I know for those in the back that's saying, well, I'm not a mind reader. Why don't you just say what you mean? Speak clearly. You know, I ascribe to that as well. I agree with that. <laughs> I think that there is room for both. I think it's important to be able to speak exactly what you feel at times. But then let's be real. We're human. We're not always going to say how we feel. We're not always going to feel comfortable saying how we feel. And so you also have to be flexible, malleable enough to say, wait, they're speaking something beneath the surface. My job is to understand what they're communicating. And that always forced them to have to be so explicit. I don't need them to always spell it out. Sometimes I need to be able to read between the lines. But that information, that skill set, that knowledge only comes if you've done your job at being a student of your spouse. And if you remember from previous episodes, I talk about the importance of being a student of your spouse. Okay. So there's, those are just some examples of what a bid could look like, but there's, oh my gosh, I mean, you can get creative with your bids and most likely you will here. I'll say this in the beginning phases of my marriage and (laughs) speaking from my past experience, I probably missed about 90% of the bids that Mandy threw my way and she was throwing them. I mean, just chucking them and I'm over here, dodging them, rejecting them, blaming or judging and not knowing that these are bids that she's putting out as an act and a desire to connect, to feel validated, to feel loved. Right. And instead I'm like, well, wait, you know, I'm, I'm ducking and dodging and then I'm rejecting. And all of a sudden she's feeling rejected. She doesn't have the confidence now that I should be giving her as spousal esteem, spousal esteem, that's confidence that you get from your spouse. But because she didn't get that from me, now she's afraid to take the risk. Now she's walking on eggshells. Now she's holding things in, right? And that was that was because of me. So I had to do a better job of learning and growing and being more understanding of the importance of turning towards your spouse. And this research, man, once I started to learn this stuff, it was groundbreaking because it changed the game for, for us. And for many of the people that I work with that I share this with, it's a game changer. But I missed about 90% of the bids Mandy would throw my way. And that should come as no surprise because, like I said earlier, I found that men struggle more in this regard than women do. And because of this, fellas, husbands, it is uber, it is super duper important (laughs) that men pay extra attention to the information that I'm talking about in this podcast and in the book that I talk about and in Dr. Gottman's book as well. You, you got to get this information. You need to, because we're not taught to do this stuff. We're not taught to do this stuff freely, right? So as you can tell, this is important. And listen, bids aren't about communicating effectively. This is not about becoming more effective as a communicator. Granted, bids is a way to communicate, This is not about effective communication. There is an entire chapter, an entire law about that. This ain't it. Rather, bids are more about your spouse communicating in a manner that is more natural to them. And again, this is something that I wrestled with, right? I was wanting Manny to allow me to communicate in a manner that was natural to me, but wasn't giving her permission to do the same for herself. This is something I had to grow in. So the responsibility to understand your spouse's bids By reading between the lines, that's on you to do. That's on you to research. That's on you to pay attention to. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to get it right all the time. It just means that you are primarily responsible for enacting the law of the pupil, right? Being a student of your spouse so that you can better learn and thus respond to your spouse's bids. Guys, listen, not just husbands, but people in general, those that are married, This is why marriage requires a lot of work. I know it's a lot, but like with any skill, the more you do it, the better off you'll be, right? 
Just because you are married doesn't mean that this stuff should come natural. You have to do the work. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself married for 10, 15, 20 years and still making all the same rookie mistakes you made at the beginning of your marriage. Okay? So let me keep moving on. Let me keep moving forward. So I have a certain bid that I do <laughs> as a husband with Mandy. It's, it's something that only I can get away with when I communicate to Mandy about it, right? <laughs> it's something that only I can get away with. Nobody else can get away with it with Mandy, but I can't because that's my boo. That's my, that's my wife. That's wifey. And I've done it for the entirety of our marriage. And guess what? She allows me to continue to do it. <laughs> and as I work primarily from home, she usually makes dinner. And often we will eat at different times. So when I'm hungry, <laughs> I usually will wander into the living room or kitchen or wherever Mandy's at, and <laughs> I'll I'll say something like, "Did you eat dinner already?" or "What what do you eat, what you eat for lunch?" And that's my bid, and she knows it. So I'm asking a linear question, what seems like a linear question, right? Like, "What did you eat for lunch?" or "Did you eat dinner already?" Or let's say she made my plate, right, and she brought it in here, and then she forgot my my drink. I may say something like, what what you what you drink for dinner? <laughs> I'll say something randomly like that. And she'll she'll scoff a little bit, smirk, but she'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And that's our way of communicating, or my way of communicating with her, hey, I'm ready to eat. Or hey, you forgot my drink. And again, this is what we do. This is our thing. Every couple, you guys will have your own unique way of communicating bids. And again, they're not just about intimacy or spending time together. Sometimes it's about, hey, I would like for you to do X for me. When Mandy was pregnant, <laughs> I still remember this like it was yesterday because I was, I was sleeping good. I had that good sleep. And I remember she, she woke up in the middle of the night. It was probably like 2, 3 in the morning. And, you know, she lay in closer to the door, which is closer to the kitchen, but she's pregnant. And she said, I would like a cup of water. But she said it out loud. I don't even think she knew I was asleep. I don't know. She just, I guess, assumed that I would hear her voice the moment she spoke. And she's just going to say, I would like a cup of water. Now, I could have acted like I was asleep because she didn't test me to see if I was awake. <laughs> but apparently she figured I was already awake. And she's just going to throw that out there. And that was her bid. That was her request for me to get my sleepy self up. Go towards the door, go towards the kitchen, get her a cup of water, bring it back in here and make sure that her belly was nice and full with water. And guess what? I did it. I acquiesced because that was her way of submitting a bid. And I caught it and I understood exactly what she was saying. And yes, the next day I made fun of her because that's what we do sometimes. But, you know, I understood that that was the bid that she was looking for me to appease. <laughs> so here's the thing. My point is that I could ask her to make me lunch or I can ask her to make me dinner. Or she could have said, hey, babe, can you go give me a cup of water? But look, my native way of expressing my hunger is to ask her what she ate. <laughs> and she knows that. And she OK with that. Sometimes she'll act like she'll know what I'm saying just to force me to be more specific. Uh, but again, that's just kind of our dynamic. That's what we do. We banter. Matter of fact, when I first met her, she would, oh my gosh, she, she thought she can hang with me, y'all. She thought she can banter with me, but, you know, I, I guess she did enough to attract me, and here we are today. <laughs> but anyway, this is what we do. It's, it's, it's part of what works for us, and we always laugh about it. We always joke about it, but this, this is part of our dynamic, part of our culture. But that's my bid, and guess what? It makes me feel loved when Mandy reads between the lines and then acquiesces. She does what I want. Okay, when I say does what I want, okay, she does do what I want, but not in the way that you think. <laughs> she do what I want. I do what she want. We do what we want from each other. That's how it works, okay? But you get the point. So you get the point. I could be more direct, but how we communicate with each other when it comes to bids, that's my way. And that's just one example. We got a lot, okay? But she gets my bid, and guess what she does? She turns towards the bid. And this makes me feel loved. This makes me feel like, yeah, she gets it. She hears it. She understands. So that's just an example. But I want to talk a little bit about the importance of this law. And then, you know what? I don't have enough time to really go through all of this information. Uh, I might talk about what happens if you break it. But I want to talk a little bit about the importance of this law 
And then I'm going to prep you guys for this 20 question quiz that I got to give you. Okay. So turning towards your spouse, turning towards your spouse's bid. This is important for one main reason. See, when you make the right turn by turning towards your spouse, when they make a bid, it sends the message to them that you see them, you value them. And here's the kicker. You are willing to selflessly meet a need that they have in the moment, even if it's not a need that benefits you. See, like I mentioned earlier, after my wife responded to my dinner or lunch bid, I felt loved. I felt like, you know what? My wife gets me and she gives me permission to give bids in the strange, quirky way. But it made me feel loved. It made me feel like, oh, I feel connected to her because she demonstrated her ability and desire to hear what I was really saying. And she also demonstrated a willingness to do something for me that I could have obviously done myself. But she did it. She sacrificed her time and her energy to meet a need by turning towards my bid. And for me, I don't require to feel loved by my spouse to know that I'm loved. Like, I don't need that at this stage in my maturation. However, however, hear me clearly, feeling loved by her helps me to feel secure in the relationship. There's a difference. There's a difference between self-esteem and spousal esteem. And I need my wife to help me to feel loved, not because I need to feel loved individually, but so that I can have safety and security and trust in our relationship. See, marriage is a lot easier when you can be completely vulnerable with your spouse, especially when you know that they selflessly love you. And if you think about it, the law of the right turn enforces the law of the safe place. Now, again, if you've read this book, you know what I mean when I talk about the law of the safe place. But if you don't, I'll quickly just say it this way. Remember, marriage is about two things intimacy and influence. And in order to grow in your intimacy and in your influence, which is ultimately what the goal is for marriage, you have to make sure that you are exemplifying the safe place. And remember, safety and security leads to vulnerability. Vulnerability leads to intimacy and intimacy leads to influence. And so the law of the right turn, when I turn towards my spouse's bid or vice versa, guess what? It makes me feel safe. It makes her feel safe. I feel very safe with my wife. I feel very safe with like she gives. And I, I I even say this to her a lot. Like I'm, I'm so glad that my wife is the type of woman that gives me permission to grow and still be myself. I have a very strong personality, right? Some of you guys know me not to, I'm not, this is not a good or a bad thing. It's just, I'm an acquired taste. Okay. It, It just, it is what it is. And my wife gives me permission to be that while also creating an environment that's conducive for her to be who she is, right? And we just help each other grow. But it's the safe place. It's the environment that allows me to feel safe here. And when she turns towards my bid or vice versa, it only reinforces the safe place even more. So anyway, as Gottman found in his research, when you make the right turn by turning towards your spouse's bid, your marriage has a much greater chance of surviving. And guess what? I'm doing everything in my power to make sure that my marriage survived. Because at one point in my history, I did everything in my power <laughs> to make sure that the marriage did not survive. Obviously, I w- that, w- that didn't work because I'm still here, but I'm doing whatever it takes to make sure that it survives. And if that means turning towards my spouse more often than not, then that's, that's what it's about. And guess what? We all got to do work. I'm not the best at this. I love my autonomy. I love my space. I love my time. I love my independence. And turning towards my spouse means that I have to also be willing to sacrifice those things that I just said I loved so that my my spouse feels safe in the marriage, feels connected in the marriage. Okay. So really quickly, I want to talk a little bit about what happens if you do break this law, because I think it's really important to understand the consequences of this so that you have more of an awareness of what to do and what not to do. And then we're going to wrap up. We're going to wrap up with how to make sure that you can apply this in your marriage. I'm going to give you an action item that I want you to do, and then I will bid you farewell. Okay. So let's talk real quickly about what happens if you, you missed the turn. 
What happens if you're traveling and you miss the turn, okay? So breaking this law means that you made the wrong turn by turning away from your spouse after they made a bid, which again, I'm telling you, it may seem basic, but it's the simple things that often aren't easy, okay? It is often better to miss a bid than to turn away from your bid. And I know that may be nuanced, so let me talk a little bit about what this looks like. So most of the time, couples will miss bids out of mindlessness or just not being on purpose. Like they're distracted. They're focused on something else. And so they just they just may miss the bid. The bulk of the damage, though, is done when there is some level of intentionality of, involved. So let me talk a little bit about what that looks like, because there is a difference between missing a bid and then intentionally turning away from a bid or making the wrong turn. So purposefully turning away when your spouse makes a bid, it can be devastating. And it often is. According to the research, it's pretty devastating long term, especially if this is done consistently over the course of time. So this happens and it's devastating because you are intentionally rejecting your spouse when you do so. See, missing a bid at least provides the opportunity for future growth and understanding. But rejecting a bid is a deliberate act of the will, and it results in your spouse giving less bids or worse, making bids for intention, enjoyment, and affection. Guess what? Somewhere else. Yeah, you got that, right? If you do this over time consistently, you run the risk of your spouse going someplace else with someone else and giving bids there. And you leave a very gaping hole for the enemy to come in and sow more dissension. Okay? Just because of intentionally rejecting the bid. So ultimately, if this happens, they will stop being vulnerable with you in this fashion. And they will invest more time more energy, and more attention into protecting themselves more so than they will be being vulnerable with you. And this is what you don't want to happen. You don't want your spouse to spend more of their energy trying to protect themselves so that they don't get hurt versus being vulnerable inside the marriage because self-preservation is the opposite of vulnerability, okay? And you don't want that because, again, vulnerability leads to intimacy. Self-preservation disconnects. Okay, in this in this context. Okay, so be mindful of that. And you can say that breaking this law, breaking the law, the right turn is the opposite of creating a safe and secure environment. So when you make a wrong turn, not only are you breaking this law, but you're also guilty of breaking the law of the safe place. And this is how all this stuff is interconnected. Right. So if you're not being mindful, you're going to find yourself doing a lot more damage than good just by virtue of turning away from your spouse. And listen, there are reasons why you can intentionally turn away from your spouse. You could be tired. You could be upset. You could be distracted. You could be focused on other things. And so what your wife is trying to do, you may not be as interested in, but that's up to you to communicate that more effectively so that they they understand and that they're aware. So let me, let me wrap up here with this notion. And I want to move forward and discuss an action item real quick, okay? And this is where I want you guys to answer 20 questions to get a sense of how good you guys are doing in this area of turning towards or turning away from your spouse. And again, this information is really important, especially if we're looking at the long-term success of your marriage, okay? So I'm going to read all 20 of these questions. I know it's a lot of reading, but I'm going to read it. It's up to you guys to Write this stuff down, uh, play it a little slower, pause if you need to, but I want you to answer true or false to the following questions. Question number one, we enjoy doing small things together like folding laundry or watching TV. True or false? And this is this information is taken from Dr. Gottman's book where I referenced earlier, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. And this is more so focused on bids, right? So... Um, it's not just about intimacy, but a lot of it is. Okay. And if you hear noise in the background, that's the thunder. I'm, I'm doing this in the, in the middle of a storm. So anyway, number two, 
I look forward to spending my free time with my spouse. True or false? Number three, at the end of the day, my spouse is glad to see me. True or false? And I want y'all to be honest with this. Number four, my spouse is usually interested in hearing my views. True or false? Number five, I really enjoy discussing things with my spouse. True or false? Number six, my spouse is one of my best friends. True or false? Number seven, I think my spouse would consider me a very close friend. True or false? Number eight, we just love talking to each other. True or false? Number nine, when we go out together, the time goes by very quickly. True or false? Number 10, we always have a lot to say to each other. True or false? Number 11, we have a lot of fun together. True or false? Number 12, we are spiritually very compatible. True or false? Uh-oh, some of y'all may have, may have fizzled out on that one. Let me keep going, let me keep going. Number 13, we tend to share the same basic values. True or false? And some of you guys may be tempted to just try to answer based off of what you desire or try to answer based off of the potential. I want you to answer based off of what's currently the reality. Because how else will you know what to improve upon if you try to answer based off of what you think could be but isn't yet? Okay. Anyway, let me go to number 14. Number 14 is this. We like to spend time together in similar ways. True or false? Number 15, we really have a lot of common interests. True or false? Number 16, we have many of the same dreams and goals. True or false? Number 17, we like to do a lot of the same things. True or false? Number 18, even though our interests are somewhat different, I enjoy my spouse's interests. True or false? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Number 19. Whatever we do together, we usually tend to have a good time. True or false? Number 20. My spouse tells me when he or she has had a bad day. True or false? Okay, so you've gone over those 20 questions. Let me tell you how to score this, and then we're going to wrap it up, okay? <laughs> so here's what I want you to do. Give yourself one point for each true answer. If you score 10 points or above, he says, congratulations. This is an area of strength in your marriage because you are so often there for each other during the minor events of your life, you have built up a hefty emotional bank account that will support you over any rough patches in your marriage. It's those little moments that you rarely think about. And when you're shopping at the supermarket, folding laundry, or having a quickie catch-up call when you guys are both still at work, that make up the heart and soul of a marriage. I hope you guys caught that. Having a surplus in your emotional bank account is what makes romance last and gets you through the hard times, the bad moods, and the major life changes. So if you've been doing the work to build up your equity, then when the difficult seasons come, you can fall back on some of the things that you've been implementing. Now, if you've scored below 10, then your marriage could be dealing with some areas that require some improvement. And so Dr. Gottman says, by learning to turn towards each other, during the minor moments in your day, you will make your marriage not only more stable, but more romantic, have more intimacy, have more connection. And every time you make the effort to listen and respond to what your spouse is saying to help them, you make your marriage a little better. Okay, so there you have it. That's just a 20 question quiz 
just to see how well you guys have been doing turning towards each other. If you score 10 or above, you're doing relatively well, okay? If you can get your score up to 17, like 16, 17, then you're on to something. That means this is a really strong area in your marriage. If you're below 10, okay, we got to step it up. That means you got to become more intentional, more focused, more perceptive, pay attention more. Otherwise, you're going to run the risk of making more mistakes. All right, so here's what we'll do, because I know this was just a quickie session just to get some information to you. It's been two weeks. I've missed you. I can't wait to get back on the weekly thing, but I am still focused. I'm in the heart of this dissertation, so y'all pray for me, but don't worry. I'm still archiving ideas and topics to discuss. But I want to wrap up here, and remember, it is my desire that both you and your spouse use this information to make your marriage go to the next level. But remember... You get out of your marriage what you put into your marriage, not what you want from your marriage. So get to work putting in the work. Also, if you have not done so already, I want you to go ahead and order yourself a copy of my 37 Laws to Mastering Marriage book. It's titled The 37 Laws to Mastering Marriage. And you can go to MasteringMarriageLaws.com to pick it up. Or just go to Amazon and order it there. Just type in the 37 Laws to Mastering Marriage. But I I implore you to get it if you don't have it. Only because this, uh, this book is written specifically to make you a smarter, more efficient spouse. Okay? Anyways, thank you guys for coming in to your session on the couch at the Marriage Counselor's Corner. Please join me in the next episode, episode number 25, where we're going to discuss another very important topic that you don't want to miss out on. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you download and listen to to them at, whether it's Spotify, iTunes, CastBox, whatever. And please make sure to leave me an honest rating and a review. That way others will have more access to these groundbreaking marriage improving episodes. And as always, I greatly appreciate any input, any feedback, any rating or review that you give me. And I also appreciate you guys that are outside, out there listening. Please keep it going. I really appreciate that, okay? Anyways, go out there and be smart, be intentional, and stay out of trouble. And I'll talk to you in two weeks. Deuces. Thanks for stopping by for your seat on the couch at the Marriage Counselor's Corner. Remember... Go to marriagecounselorscorner.com to schedule your next session. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss a session. We look forward to having you back on the couch soon. Bye-bye now.